Next speaker is, is Dennis Woods from Discovery Geophysics. Uh, uh, the title of his talk is New Generation Jesse High Temperature Squid TEM Results Over the Lawler Deposit. Uh, Dennis received his BSc and MSc from Queen's University and his PhD from Australian National University. Uh, he spent seven years as geophysics professor, professor in Department of Geological Sciences at Queen's, 10 years as a geophysical consultant with various contracting and mining companies in Vancouver, including five years at Grangus with operations in Flimflon. Past 18 years, he spent as part owner, director, and chief geophysicist of Discovery Geophysics. Thanks, Peter. Uh, when um, Ken suggested doing this, <laughs> thanks, Ken, uh, I was in the room with a bunch of other people. It was at the, um, at the roundup, and um, Ken was talking about, uh, hey, it'd be a good idea if we got everybody together and talk about Lawler. And uh, so I stuck up my hand and said, okay, I can, I'll help look after this and uh, try to organize it. But I knew in the back of my head was that I had a canned presentation all along. This was a presentation done by Dave Bingham in uh, Saskatoon with Living Sky Geophysics, he calls his company, and his partner, uh, Grant Nimick. Uh, Dave did a bunch of the modeling here, and he produced a talk, and he gave that talk. Uh, so I had this all the time, so I knew that I could uh, spend my efforts on uh, organizing this thing and, and uh, not have to worry about so much about the presentation. So I'm essentially just reading Dave's, uh, Dave's presentation. Uh, he's uh, thanking uh, Discovery and uh, LSGI, his own company, and Hud Bay, the ones that uh, put this all together. Uh, this all derives from a, um, when we first obtained a, a squid uh, EM sensor uh, in 2008, and I looked around for some place to test it. We tested it up in the uh, Athabasca Basin for deep conductors there, but I wanted to really try it on something that was uh, really conductive and go to very late time, low, low frequency. And uh, uh, the Lauder deposit was the obvious candidate. So we contacted Hud Bay, and uh, they agreed to uh, let us come over and, and do a test survey. We did that in uh, December of 2009. The, uh, the squid, well, he's, he's got some slides here about where Lawler is and the geology. I don't need to go through that. Uh, the, the squid's a uh, uh, extremely sensitive magnetometer, probably one of the most sensitive magnetometers available. Uh, Dave likes to put it on this uh, scale of, whoops, of uh, different magnetic events with the or magnetic fields with neutron stars up here at the top in gigateslas going all the way down to uh, a low temperature squid which is in the femtotesla range. So quite a few orders of magnitude of, of uh, sensitivities. And uh, <clears throat> a tesla of course uh, where magnetic activity is, induction coils in this area here, human brain, kind of interesting, flux gate, the high temperature squid a little bit above the low temperature squid. And I'll have another slide uh, in, a, in a few seconds about uh, uh, some more uh, sensitivity analysis. Uh, the squid uh, comes out of the physics labs in the 50s when it was first discovered, when the physicists started playing around with uh, uh, liquid nitrogen, liquid helium, uh, and cryogenic temperatures, realizing that uh, you cool metals down low enough, uh, they lose all electrical resistance. And so electrons can flow f uh, freely in any, uh, any structure. There was this uh, uh, physicist, Josephson, who discovered the fact that to, if you had a small gap in a ring structure, uh, the, the electric field, which is now uh, the uh, electrons, which are now free to flow, will actually, uh, in, a, in a quantum uh, sense, will jump that gap. And the interference that's set up by that uh, uh, physical phenomena uh, is affected by the magnetic field that goes through this thing. So this is the actual types of uh, Josephson junctions that they first built. They were about a centimeter in size. They cooled them down to liquid nitrogen temperatures and measured magnetic fields. Well, then we move on to uh, semiconductor technology, and you can build the same thing down at semiconductor scales, and we're down now to three microns sort of s size. Uh, there's two types. One is, uh, works at liquid helium temperatures at 40 degrees K, and it's mostly at niobium. And then, uh, then they discovered that 
with a, a, a more complex arrangement of, of metals, uh, you could actually get this whole thing to work at uh, liquid nitrogen temperatures at 77 degrees K. And that uh, resulted in what's called the high temperature squid. So this is a low temperature, which is liquid helium, high temperature, liquid nitrogen. Uh, here's some shots. Uh, this is in uh, 2008 when we first took delivery of the first squid from, uh, from the Germans at IPHT. This is my partner Brent uh, doing a survey, a test survey out in the Athabasca. We married it to a uh, uh, EMIT Smart Tim. This is the old Smart Tim 4, but uh, we've since uh, moved up to Smart Tim 24s. So we married it to that, and uh, as a transmitter, we use a Phoenix transmitter. We use uh, Zong transmitters. We'll use anything to get enough power into the ground. Uh, these two gentlemen here are from IPHT. This is really the inventor of this, uh, this particular squid, this um, ceramic uh, high temperature uh, liquid uh, nitrogen squid. And here they are filling it up with liquid nitrogen. So this is a sensitivity uh, curve that I uh, drew up from published data. All, of this, uh, all these noise spectrums, so we, we plotted uh, the square root uh, uh, the spectral noise per square root hertz, and it's always plotted that way in order to even things out over the spectrum, um, versus frequency, going all the way down to 0 0.1 up to 100,000 100, hertz. And induction coils, of course, work extremely well at the higher frequency, but they fail, well, not fail, but they are less sensitive uh, as you go to lower frequencies. Uh, whereas a squid, here's the low temperature squid, and this is our high temperature squid. Uh, they're much more uh, flat over the, over the spectrum. And it's this curve here that just is the inherent advantage of a squid sensor for EM. You've got at least a, an order of magnitude difference between the best of the B-field coils, or any sort of coil, to a squid, and then another uh, order of magnitude or two, or one and a half at least, uh, down to the low temperature squid, liquid nitrogen squids. Liquid nitrogen squids are available. Uh, they were used in magnetotellurics uh, back in the day. Uh, I don't think uh, many people use them anymore for magnetotellurics. Uh, the, the portable one uh, developed by IPHT is exclusive to Anglo, and uh, they, they use that and have been for quite a few years. Uh, the high temperature squid, uh, there was one uh, developed at CSIRO called the Lantem. And then um, I met these gentlemen from IPHT, and they had a prototype, and I convinced them to build a three-component three version, and, um, and that's what happened. The advantage is um, in sensitivity. Uh, obviously, you can get a, a more uh, accurate measurement of the EMB field, but there is also inherent advantages in measuring B versus DBDT in, in um, differentiating between uh, strong and weak conductors. The idea is to measure B field and see late time decays at low frequency uh, out, out of the, uh, the better conductors. Uh, he's got a whole bunch more here. <laughs> I'll skip over that. Um, the, uh, yeah, this is a, 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 a diagram to sort of show this, how you can measure out to much later times at a low frequency. Here we are at half a hertz. We're collecting data down at a quarter hertz or even an eighth of a hertz now uh, in some cases. Um, and you get much longer uh, uh, gate times than uh, what's traditionally been available uh, previously. So now we'll get to some data from this actual test. Uh, we've got some decay curves. Uh, we also had a coil with us when we did this initial test. This is, you've got to remember, this is like the first, second or third survey we did with this instrument. So we weren't really kind of used to it. We wanted to see how it performed, how it compared to coils and so on. So we set up, we set up a coil beside the squid, and um, we, collected, uh, well, we collected both at 5 hertz, and we collected both at 1.5 hertz. The coil... Uh, response at 1.5 hertz was uh, quite bad, but the um, and so I got a comparison here of the Jesse HT uh, S at uh, 1.5, 1.6 sorry, uh, versus uh, induction coil at 5 hertz, and you can see the you know the much longer, uh, larger response at late time uh, of B versus DBDT, uh, both in a Lin log plot and a log long plot. 
And here we have a couple of uh, decay curves showing the difference between two different frequencies, 1.6 hertz and 0.5. Now, obviously, you're going to get uh, lower signal at, uh, at this lower frequency, uh, but it does go out to later time. Here's a profile. Um, I'll just flip ahead to the map. This is on line 17600, this line here, right over the center of the thing. Uh, this uh, graph is actually from Mark Shore. He gave a presentation at the PDAC about two, two three years ago, two years ago, uh, where he compared his own flux gates, shown here, with some um, from LANTEM data and then our, our, um, our, our Jesse HTS uh, squid data. And with, you know, the point being that it's uh, just a lot smoother, a lot less noise, and uh, more accurate uh, measurements. Uh, we actually did, in total, four lines uh, across this thing. Uh, note this, uh, this one line here, uh, 19200, is just uh, sort of off the north end. And then the cross line is uh, off to the northeast. Uh, again, some more about details about the, uh, the geology here, but I can skip over that. Uh, Dave uh, modeled this uh, with Maxwell, and uh, I think I have to... Uh, <laughs> Second, what uh, Dave uh, Coop just said. Um, uh, Dave Bingham's uh, model showed a, uh, he, he had a, a one plate here to represent uh, all the copper zinc, uh, or sorry, the zinc, um, zinc zone, zinc pyrotite zones. And then another plate uh, dipping off a little steeper uh, to image the, um, the, the deeper copper zone. And this is his final model, drill holes. He needed another plate in here as well. Uh, up higher to uh, you know, model some of the, uh, the higher, higher wave number uh, type response. So these are the four lines. Oops, back up. Here's uh, that uh, same line I showed earlier, 17600, uh, the next line over. So those are right over the center of it. Z on the top, X on the bottom. Cross over in the X, peak into Z. Uh, these are these two profiles that are just a little bit off the, uh, the Lawler deposit. This is at the, the north edge here on this 19200, and this is the cross line. But there is still, uh, you know, there's some nice response in here, and he's, he did a nice job model fitting this. He's quite, quite good with Maxwell, actually. Uh, there's the uh, model again. And uh, this, is the cur this is the one I like the best. Because it shows um, on that line 17600, uh, it shows the difference between if you just have the, the upper uh, pure tight uh, zinc zone by itself, that's the response you get. But if you add this deeper, uh, the lower copper gold zone dipping off to the north, you can match the data a lot better. So, you know, my, my thesis is that uh, these, uh, the data is smooth enough, it's uh, got enough power, we have enough, with a high energy uh, transmitter, we had enough power to, to energize this thing. We're, we're seeing it, uh, uh, the sensitivity of the squids are high enough that we see, this, see it really well, and, um, and so we can see this much deeper, kilometer deep uh, lower body. Uh, so this is some of Dave's uh, conclusions. Um, yes, accuracy, uh, the inherent uh, ability of, uh, of B-field measurements versus DBDT in looking uh, past uh, a lower conductive uh, near surface uh, low, low conductance uh, uh, geologic formations and be able to see the, the good conductors. And I think I'll leave it at that. Any questions? And we've got lots of time, so feel free to roast them. <laughs> I guess at this point, Dennis, thanks for the presentation. I, I recall a, a comment Richard Smith made some years ago. And he said, you know, once, once one person finds it, everybody seems to be able to find it. And, you know, I guess your, your signal to noise was, was exemplary and the rest of it. But I guess to go back to the couple presentations where it took the you had a head frame, basically, a stone's throw away from the 
<laughs> well, I, I can comment on that because, um, you know, th th those sort of ideas have gone through my head as well. Um, I, I used to work in uh, Portugal and in, on the pyrite belt, and it's a beautiful place to work, you know, if you've ever been to Portugal. It's wide open, it's easy to move loops, it's, it's just great. Um, there's fences, but that's about it, the odd power line. But uh, it, it occurred to me that there's, there's a lot of deep targets. Uh, and also the, uh, the, the Lawler, oh, sorry, not the Lawler, the, um, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's one of the Nevis Corvo ore bodies. Very conductive, very late gate anomaly, uh, very deep as well. Uh, that's when I first got very excited about doing squid surveys. Um, we had a chrome crew there doing surveys, and I thought, this is the greatest thing. We, i got to get one of these. At any rate, my idea was, why bother doing airborne? I mean, we're, we're, looking, we're trying to look down a kilometer here. Why don't we just uh, march along? This, this is all open farmland. We could just uh, march along doing one line after another of deep squid or whatever, EM, deep EM, and uh, try to find the big elephants rather than, um, you know, Missing something deep. Didn't go anywhere though. Nobody, <laughs> nobody picked it up. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you didn't do enough of it. <laughs> uh, Jim. Uh, nitrogen's dead easy. I mean, you know, every city of a decent size has uh, a, a dealer of liquid nitrogen because every hospital, or, you know, every dermatologist uses liquid nitrogen all the time. So there's, there's no problem getting liquid nitrogen. I, you can call up, you know, it, at my home in South Surrey. I had a, a squid in the garage and I wanted to test it and I just called up a guy and he drove by in a truck and filled it up and he drove away. It was, uh, cost me about, you know, three or five bucks or something like that. It was very easy. Liquid helium is a bit more of a problem. It's becoming a rare commodity. Well, not really rare, but it's getting more and more expensive, uh, and we're losing it all the time. And so, um, you know, there may be a limit on, uh, on the expense uh, side of things of dealing with liquid nitrogen, or liquid helium, rather. And liquid helium, there's only two places in Canada you can buy it. One's in Toronto, and the other's Vancouver. So if you're doing a survey in Flin Flon, you have to get it shipped out from uh, Toronto or Vancouver. I don't know if any magnetic observatories use squids or not. They used to be used in MT back in the day, right? You remember those big ones from She Corporation? Yeah, they take two people to carry it around. But nobody uses those much uh, now. No. Okay, well, thank you very much.